we'll start with uh, a few examples of cardiovascular disease in rodents. The handout I provided basically has uh, the lead subjects for everything that uh, I will talk about today, with the exception of some slides in the last carousel on transgenic animals, which I added at the last minute. This is a heart and lung from a partly albino guinea pig that demonstrates a condition in the heart called metastatic calcification. Metastatic calcification in the guinea pig uh, affects numerous tissues, and I'll, I'll discuss that more in detail when we get to some of the other tissues. But it is a good example of mineralization or calcification in either the epicardium or the myocardium difficult to see sometimes at the growth examination as to how deep that lesion is. You can tell, though, it's pretty vast in its distribution. In the, in the guinea pig, you have to have the right balance of calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. And the few outbreaks that have been reported in the literature of metastatic calcification in the guinea pig, one being right after the Aberdeen Proving Ground in the 70s, was associated with hypomagnesemia. This is a subgrowth photograph of a bouncy mouse, and right on the surface of the heart is this raised area. And this is pretty representative of epicardial calcification in mice. This was one of several animals that I saw with this condition from one specific vendor where we bought all of our bouncy animals from for monoclonal antibody production. We received 4,000 animals per week, and a fairly high percentage of them had this lesion. A little higher power to show it's multifocal in its distribution, and in this example, there are, there's mineralization deeper in the heart. If you go back to the literature, there are certain strains of mice that only have this lesion in the myocardium. There are some strains that only have it in the ep epicardium, and there are some that have it in both places. The DBA2, C, and C3H strains have this most commonly. I'd have to put Bob C's on top of this list also. There's a higher power to show that these small concretions uh, often have crevices and cracks in them because they're hard to cut with a microfilm, as you might imagine. With a massage trichrome stain, you can see that not a lot of fibrous connective tissue is present in these, and I'll show you why in a minute. This is a von Casa to show that uh, it does stain for phosphate, and a lizard in red to show that it's primarily calcium, so it's a calcium phosphate and that's what I've always thought until about four years ago when I saw a lot more of these conditions, these animals. And we were doing pearl stains for another reason, and this heart came back with the tissues, and lo and behold, there was a lot of iron in that epicardial calcification. So it, if that's true, if there is blood there, there may, be a, there, there may be a leaky pathogenesis, in other words, slow-occurring hemorrhage. If that's, the, if that's true, then it's really dystrophic calcification. So if you see this lesion and it's only in the heart, you know, be, beware. It could be dystrophic calcification. Be sure and rule that out in your differential diagnosis when you're trying to come up with an algorithm for the type of lesion that occurs. An example would be some, another group of mice that we received that died acutely. They, they were pure acute deaths. They literally jumped up in the cage and fell down dead. And my, my animal care staff sometimes referred to those as popcorn mice. So you, you can see um, a mononuclear cell infiltrate out on the surface but in these animals that died, notice the eosinophilic fibers with the pycnotic nuclei. And that's about all I found. 
The rest of the organs were normal. Not sure what caused that. This is a lesion in the guinea pig heart. It's an example of an expanding mass that can occur in the heart of any rodent or other laboratory animal as far as that goes. When we think of cardiac tumors, we think back in veterinary school we, what we learned about cattle. The presence of fibromas, myxomas, and squanomas at, in the AV valves or in the right atrium of the heart. And we think about what we know about dogs and hemangiosarcomas and apud tumors that occur in those animals. When you think about laboratory animals, there are just not a lot of primary tumors that occur in the heart. This is an exception, and it's a mesenchoma, and it's unique for the guinea pig. The guinea pigs don't usually get tumors, unless you, in fact, the most tumors you'll see are from practitioners that present them to you, because those guinea pigs are three, four, and five years of age sometimes. And, you, and if they ever get to that age, that is the common cause of death. I've seen uh, four cases from one veterinary practitioner in Raleigh, North Carolina, and all of them were over four. And they all had sarcomas, every one of them, which isn't what I'm about to tell you. Uh, guinea pigs get lymphosarcomas, and they get trichofolliculomas of the skin. Gary Dill, who many of you know, was the first to describe that lesion in the guinea pig. They get fibroadenomas of the mammary gland, ovarian teratomas, and a few pulmonary adenomas. But that, that is pretty much it for guinea pig tumors. If you find good guinea pig tumor cases, publish them, please. That, uh, the literature is void of that kind of data. This lesion usually occurs in the right atrium. This is from a rat, and it uh, is a good example of periarteritis or polyarteritis nodosa. It's a muscular, smooth muscle hypertrophy and dilat dilatation of the blood vessel that occurs, uh, cause unknown, in aging rats. It is, it's uh, more prevalent in certain strains of rats than others. Um, when I was with the National Toxicology Program, I looked at over 200 studies in the fish of 344 rats, and, and we saw this lesion microscopically from time to time, but very rarely saw it on the gross. Talking to my colleagues in the industry, the ones that necropsy a lot of whiskars or spread dollies, they see this much more frequently than the fisher rats. These animals sometimes will die of hemorrhage. When you open them up and they, you've got an abdominal cavity full of blood, and then you find one of these lesions that ruptures. Let's talk about a few respiratory diseases. These are the causes of respiratory disease in mice, or at least some of them. Sendai virus, pneumonia virus of mice, Some people would say that PVM is not a primary pathogen. It depends on the species of animal you're looking at. Right outside the city, the, the city limits of Bethesda is a, is, a, is a place that holds laboratory animals for NIH investigators. And in that one place when I was working uh, for the National Cancer Institute in 1977, eight and nine, that, that, that era, we had rats out there that had Sendai, TVM, and mycoplasma. If you walked into the room, you could hear the grinding of their teeth, which is classically described with mycoplasma. And their titers for Sendai, back in those days before ELISA, was one to 2,000 in that area. So they, and they were alive and living. And then a colony of mice was moved from another location into this building, and they had PVM, and it was right across the hall from where the rats were, and the rats started dying. And Tony Allen and I worked those cases up, and the titers for PVM and those same animals we had previous serological data on was greater than 2,000. So it's what I'm getting at is that PVM can be the cause of death 
if it's synergistic with something else, including Pasteurella pneumotropica in mice. That is well documented. The two are synergistic. And I'll tell you more about Pasteurella pneumotropica, the so-called non-pathogen, if you ask your vendor. These uh, two viruses are in the same family group. Uh, Bordetella in rodents does occur. Turinobacterium cuturi infection in mice is uh, seen from time to time. If it does occur, it's usually feral rodents are the source. I had one outbreak involving 1,300 mice out of a room, of, out of a building full of 200,000 mice. And uh, but I, that was at what is now NCPR, was Pine Bluff Arsenal, Arkansas, at the time. And in that example, uh, we, we actually caught live mice, field mice, in cages and necropsied them and serologically tested them. And uh, they cultured out positive for turning back to the So that was the source. It, it's a very devastating disease and can result in pyogranulomas in a number of different organs. including the respiratory system. Klebsiella pneumoniae is, uh, is another important organism and is an avid fibrin producer. And that's usually the way that you diagnose it on the gross and microscopic and differentiate it from some of the other um, etiologic agents, unless you're talking about mycoplasma, which can also cause fibrin. Pastorella um, can be fibrinous, but it's usually chronic when, it, when that occurs. Streptococcal agents, uh, we'll talk about that more in guinea pigs. Murine mycoplasmosis, still around, still seen. Pneumocystis carini and various forms of neoplasia of the lung. This is a DBA mouse, and uh, it, it has that I don't want to get up and go to work attitude. The, the animal has a humped back. Notice the position of the back feet. It, it, he's, trying, he's trying to get his weight up and off his chest because his chest has pretty severe lesions in the lung. Um, this humped back appearance could be associated with renal disease or liver disease or a number of things, but, but uh, Respiratory disease has to be in that differential when you see an animal like this. They sniff and they have some kind, some, sometimes have a nasal discharge. But usually, if it's Sendai virus, they're found dead. It depends on the strain of the mouse. Nudes are extremely sensitive to Sendai, and this strain, DBAs, are very sensitive. If you, if you kind of ranked them from top to bottom, this is how it looked. I, I included some strains that were more resistant, some that, were, some that were in the middle. But this is not all the strains, but it gives you an example of the distribution. There are, there are susceptibility differences between strains, and that's the take on this. An acute, like an acute Sendai pneumonia looks like this with this plum-colored lobe. And in a nude mouse, they get this marked hypertrophy of the cells of the upper airways in the bronchi and we're in the bronchioles, primarily in the bronchioles. Then if you were to do electron microscopy of that lesion, you'd find the organism, the virus. They decimate the epithelium. and attempts to regenerate occur. And as long as, as, long as they, the basement membrane's intact and they, they start to get some more air, uh, epithelium back, they prob they're probably gonna recover. They may have some residual lesions, but they, they will recover. If, if it goes to squamous metaplasia like this, and all the cilia, cilia law are lost, there's no way to get debris and, and mucus and other uh, harmful things 
back up the airway. And they usually get secondary infections. Notice that all these are poly, and they'll get a bacterial overgrowth, and they'll die. So this is a higher power of the squamous metaplasia, and a little outpocketing there. If then they finally get to this point, I've had MD pathologists come in and show me slides off of toxicity trial, and they've looked at this lesion and, and call this a dysplasia, leading to squamous carcinoma. And what they're looking at is the pulmonary adenomatosis type lesion with epithelialization, and then squamous metaplasia like this. This lesion right here can persist for one year. So if you've had a Sendai problem early on in a study, and then the, the, mor the mortality is low, beware, because when you go back to read the slides, you're going to see lesions like this one in that subgroup that I showed you. Now, if you're wondering about whether it's caused by the compound, read your control first. They'll have this too. This is a lung that did not sink in the formalin, and it was meaty, like this Arabian bowl lung, and it has, it has this filling defect where you can actually see the outline of the alveoli and this yellow material. And microscopically, need some help on that focus. Um, microscopically, there's this eosinophilic material that's out in the alveolar space. In this example, not too many inflammatory cells are associated with it. Here's another case in, in an AIDS patient, a human AIDS patient that died, that has a little bit more inflammation, but it's more of a lymphocytic, plasmacytic infiltrate. This eosinophilic material out here, um, in fact, is the per or ha has the organisms in it of pneumocystis carini. I just got a reprint just before I got, got on the plane where they had done uh, transmission studies with pneumocystis carini to see whether or not it was species specific or not. And the bottom line on it was that pneumocystis carini is not or is, does not transmit to some animals, but it does to others. Um, take that with a large grain of salt because the immune system is different strains of animals. Different. So I, I'd have to see more data on that. But I, the, the thinking by most MD pathologists is that this is the same organism no matter what species it is, but I'm not sure I agree with that. We, we, we have used the human monoclonal antibody to pneumocystis carini to diagnose pneumocystosis and skid mice at our own institute just recently. That was the Gamoris Mucinopene Silver thing. Can we focus that, please? This is a uh, good example of uh, mycoplasmosis in the rat. And it's, it's basically a bronchopneumonia or parabronchial lesion with bronchiectasia in the later stages. Here's another case, and it shows the bronchiectasia quite well. But this, this is a more of an acute lesion, and the bronchiectasia is more of a chronic lesion. You can see on the surface of this lobe, there are, it, these lesions are raised. Microscopically, rat lungs always have some bulk or bronchial associated lymphoid tissue. It's rare to not find some if they're immunologically intact. With mycoplasmosis, sometimes the earliest recognition that you're having problems is if you're looking at microscopic sections and you see this much bulk. If there's, if there's uh, 
if you've lost your ciliated epithelium and you've got a lot of neutrophils in there, that's a bad sign too, because that's your, your bronchiectasia will de definitely start if they, can't, if they have no way to mechanically get this material back up the airway. And that, so you end up with this. And you get mucosils and trapped debris down in the distal portions of the lung. Now this is another rat, and in this case it's very similar. There's lymphoid aggregates around where it should be, but it's exaggerated. And out here in the lumen, there's some mucus and an inflammatory cell. And a higher power, you can see the cilia, but the cilia are too easy to see. And the reason they are is because they're matted together. This eosinophilic area is matted together. And they're matted together because there's an organism there. And that's what actually, it's actually what you're looking at. This is the cilia associated respiratory bacillus, car bacillus, described by uh, Ganaway. This is the ear to show that it also occurs there. And this is a Worth and Starry stain to show the organism. You can see that, that that matting, that dense area that you saw out on the epithelial surface, is the organism. You can see them here in the individual form. In the rat, um, they get homophilus, which mice very seldom ever did. Streptococcus pneumoniae is uh, more common in the rat. They get mycotic disease, aspergillosis, candidiasis. They get the one I just described. It's been described in more than one animal type now. It's, uh, they get rat coronavirus infection. And they get the migratory stages of Trichotomoides crossicata in the lung. Streptococcal infections and guinea pigs. They, uh, this is a bad disease in the guinea pigs. It can be subtle like this, which is rhinitis, which is usually curable. It can be an acute pneumonia or a chronic pneumonia, but if it's, if it's chronic, they get a lot of fibrin with it. And in strep pneumoniae, they get all this fibrinous pericarditis and fibrinous pneumonia. If you were to if you were to uh, look at it microscopically, you'd see this thickened area of fibrin and inflammatory cell infiltrate. And if you were to do a touch impression smear here, you'd see the bacteria on the gram stain out here. It's a good way to diagnose it if you think that's what you have. And in the abdominal cavity, this, this, this came from an outbreak in guinea pigs that occurred about 200 yards from this building. And uh, it was the fibrinous, per the fibrinous uh, peritonitis was uh, very pre prevalent in this colony when this outbreak occurred. Here's an acute case of streptococcal disease with pericarditis, and that, that, that also occurred. The, the disease that everybody thinks about when they think of streptococcus is cervical lymphadenitis. Cervical lymphadenitis uh, causes a lymphadenopathy and it's usually bilateral and the organism that causes it is a streptococcus epidemicus, which is a landfill type C beta, beta hemolytic strep. If 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 you're if you're trying to think of things that would cause a lymphadenitis in a guinea pig then you'd have to include cadian leukemia as a type C on coronavirus, streptobacillus maniliaformis, and there have been cases reported of absidia corundifera, which is, I believe, in the zygomycin family of, of hyphae forming fungi. Here you can see the skin's been reflected and the nodes are quite enlarged. And when you, they're opened up, they have this very thick uh, exudate. If it looks like that, it's strep until proven otherwise. 
guinea pigs also get arthritis with this. The swelling of the foot is what, uh, what you'll see clinically. Another disease uh, that you have to consider in your differential diagnosis when you have strep is your sinosis or your sinia pseudotuberculosis, which occurs in guinea pigs. And it, it has this symbolic appearance where it, it, you can see the lesion was raised on the growth and the lesion is subpleural. It can be in deeper structures, but it's always usually always subpleural because of lymphatics. And these lesions um, do, uh, shown here in the, in the lung, uh, have a, a rim of lymphocytes and macrophages and, and with a center that's undergoing these caseation and necrosis people. Ca causes of pulmonary nodules include things like abscesses, granulomas or pyogranulomas, and cysts of various kinds, and neoplasms. Pulmonary neoplasia in rodents can be summarized in, in these diagnoses. There's a, there's a bronch, the, the nomenclature for the mouse changes about once every two years. But the mouse, the, the rat seems to stay about the same. The bronchiolar alveolar adenoma or carcinoma, depending upon size and, and uh, de-differentiation and invasion, um, is still the term of choice in the rat lung. Most, most people still use the term BA tumors for, for mice lung, but the current literature would say that they're all alveolar type 2 cell adenoma. The bronchiolar adenoma in the mouse is a clericel tumor, so it's a different cell type. And the squamous cell carcinoma is just another tumor that can occur in rodents. It's not as common, in fact, it's very rare as a primary naturally occurring event, not induced by chemical, especially an inhalation step. The VA tumor or type 2 tumor in the mouse is strain specific. And one of the animal models that's used in toxicology work is the strain A mouse because it has such a high incidence of this tumor, 70 to 90 percent over time. And one thing that's commonly done is they will inject a dye like India ink, right at the time of necropsy. And the lung tumors will pick up the dye so that if you, in, then if you in, infuse the lung at the necropsy table and have a fully distended lung, you can look down at the lung tissue and turn it over and actually count the number of black tumors, same with the India ink, in your control group versus your treatment group and that's the way you make the decision on carcinogenicity. I worry about studies like that that don't have any microscopic endpoints because um, a lump is a lump is a lump. And a tumor is, may or may not be a neoplasm. I would feel better if they did at least did selective histopathology on these studies. Um, the AB, I mean, the A, this is another strain of mouse, the AB. This A is from Jackson Laboratory. You see the Swiss mouse has a very high incidence. And then as you go down, DBAs, you see 57 blacks rarely fit. Now, a fairly new strain of mouse on the horizon is the FVB mouse. It's been around for a long time, but it is, it's really become popular because of transgenic science. A lot of the transgenic mouse users prefer the FBB. It's a hardy little mouse. It's uh, very healthy. But they do have a fairly high incidence of naturally curling VA tumors in the lung. This is what they look like. This is an infused lung, not perfused. And there's a solitary lesion down here that's slightly raised. Here's another one that's more raised. And they, they can range in color from all white to, to yellowish white to kind of a tan color. When they're tan, that causes a little bit, a little bit of a problem in the determining what it might be by growth. Tan tumors can, be, can mimic their primary if it was a metastatic tumor. 
So thyroid, Oregon, has to be considered in your differential if it's a tan. But if it's this color, think BA tumor until otherwise. They, they classically look like this. This is a nude mouse. I believe it's a nude mouse. And um, you no, notice that it has dense areas of base cilia around the edge, and it has this uh, very solid tumor that appears to have some kind of a distinct pattern to it. And it is uh, more of a papillary tumor. This basophilia turns out to be tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this uh, very well differentiated papillary pattern is uh, seen with these types of tumors. Sometimes they're missed on the growth at the time of necropsy. And but one of the, one of, this is one of those things that a lot of times it's easier to diagnose in fixed tissue. Here's the lesion right here. This was uh, this is a nude mouse. And if you cut this lesion cut in, it looked like this. It, it was slightly raised, and that's what it looked like on the subgrowth. They're usually in that subpleural location. Metastatic tumor result can also occur in the lung. And they can come from mammary tissue, uh, the subcutaneous area, our dairy glands, liver, ovary, either the renal pelvis or urinary bladder or ureter, the kidney itself in the form of tubular cell tumor carcinoma, bone, nerve, blood vessels, and the renal cortex. This is a condition that I had seen briefly um, as long as 15 years ago, but in the last four years, I've seen a lot of it, and I'm not sure I understand why. It's an acid and it's been described in, in vet path in the last three years as a acidophilic macrophage pneumonia in mine. <coughs> I've had uh, I've shown this to a number of physicians. They've never seen anything like it. It's characterized by large eosinophilic alveolar macrophages and the presence or absence of multinucleated giant cells, a lot of inflammatory cell infiltrate, <clears throat> an eosinophilic intracellular crystalloid inclusion, intracellular. Then there's an extracellular one. And I, I believe this is a continuum, and that once it reaches a certain size, the cell membrane breaks and then they, they coalesce. <clears throat> this is what we see. It's a large pink cell with a small nucleus, sometimes with more than one nucleus, one, two, three, or four. They vary in shape a little bit, just from being flat on one end, oval, round, sometimes tear shaped and that's, that, actually, this slide right here was taken from that case of the great big VA tumor I showed you a few minutes ago, is where I said there were tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that were also these cells right next to it. So that would be about the most subtle form. And this is uh, one that's pretty bad. You can see that the eosinophilic cells merge and coalesce, become a little bit more granular, and then they start to have these inclusions. This was misdiagnosed at the necropsy table as a neoplasm. And it's, it's a very good example of the pneumonia described in the literature with this. In these more severe cases, you see uh, aggregates of cells and a lot of inflammatory cells in between the crystals. These are the crystals. Well, any good pathologist would do special stains on case like this. So it was negative for Masson, negative for Tulidium blue, negative for Alcyon blue. We did an ABC technique for IgG, and it was negative, as it was for IgM. It was not PAS positive, 
It was uh, negative for crystal violet and Congo red, but it was positive for Ophizema stain for hemoglobin. And there's the same. Same, kind of a reddish orange. I don't know what this is pathogenesis wise. I can't find very many people who have really pursued it. But <clears throat> when we went back and tried to find something in the literature, the first, the first case was described in 1905, and Dr. Tizer of Tizer's disease fame described it in 1909, and then Yang, in, as recently as 1964, described it quite well. Frith described it in a very low incidence in valve sea mice under 11 months of age. Here's 32 cases of C57 black. Keep that in mind, the C57 black. This is the NMR I mouse, which is, a, I believe, the National Medical Research Institute across the street from here. And uh, they have a mouse strain that's unique to, to, to their building. It's, uh, it's all over the United States, however. I've no, I've no immunologist to use that mouse all over the place. But they had a low incidence of this. And then Van Sweeten reported up to 30% incidence in age six, P57 black six males and up to 16% in females. So it's suggesting anyway that there's a sex predisposition, or at least a difference in sex. We, uh, we see a lot of it in C57 black mice. I see a lot of it in animals that are used for gene therapy, and I see it occasionally in the SEB mouse. Things are not always what they seem. Well, now we'll talk about urinary diseases. Um, this is our, some of the causes of urinary disease in rodents. They can be hereditary. Uh, things like renal aplasia or, or, or hereditary hydronephrosis or cortical cysts of various types would fit into that category. There are several different kinds of, of obstructive neuropathies nutritional diseases that can affect the kidney, endocrine imbalances, chemical toxins, metabolic diseases like diabetes mellitus that fit into that, uh, immune disease of various types, whether it's an anti-basement membrane disease or an, an immune complex disease that's in a sub-epithelial or sub endothelial location, vascular diseases involving the glomerulus tuft or in the blood vessels that supply the kidney, primary and malignant and metastatic tumors of the kidney and those caused by bacteria or fungi and other agents like protozoa or even metazoans. This is a good example of a fat mouse. It's not an OBOB -OB mouse, which is a genetic strain that looks very similar to this. If you had to put a name on this for morphologic diagnosis, the most correct answer would be anasarca. It's generalized subcutaneous edema. If you were to take this, this animal's dead. If you were to take this animal and turn him over on his side, this little puppy area right there would, actually the fluid would drain from one leg down to the other, and then the skin would flatten out on the glass. It's, it's that severe. This was uh, one of many nude mice that I saw with an in-complex glomerulonephritis when we used them for human tumor xenograft. Here's another case, a little better photography on the, on the exposure side. You see, I mean, this, this looks like a sheep with nematodes, you know. It has a hypoproteinemia presence of a lot of subcutaneous edema. Also, this very enlarged abdomen. See how puffy the face is, the cheeks? This is a normal skin from a nude mouse. 
And the muscle layers here, here's the adnexin hair follicle. And uh, there's some sebaceous glands here. So pay attention to the distance between here and here. And in the, the animals that had anasarca, everything was flattened. It was flattened on the top side, and the muscle layer is thinner. This is all fluid retention. When you look when you look into the abdominal cavity, the, the whole this all of the gastrointestinal tract looks kind of like distended or or glistening like this. There was edema in the walls of the small intestine and large intestine. The kidneys on the gross exam did not look that abnormal. They were a little plumper than normal. They looked a little turgid. But other than that, I couldn't see anything wrong with them. But microscopically, they all looked like this. There was a pink eosinophilic material in the glomeruli that almost completely filled up Bowman's face. And not a, a dramatic increase in the number of nuclei per glomeruli. Here's a better power of that. You can see the Bowman space is almost completely obliterated by this large expanding glomerulus. These were immune complexes, and because of that, the glycoproteins and stain positive with periodic acid chips. The Jones stain, which is a, a space and membrane stain, uh, was not that helpful, but it did um, show the, the fact that there was not a lot of new bases material and not an increase in the vandule cell. The Jones stain was good for showing crescents and early uh, fibrosis. The son's trichrome was, uh, demonstrates that better. You can see the old Bowman's capsule right here and some of the material that stains blue is outside of that. It's both inside and outside and the glomerular tuft as everything that's blue is fibrous connected tissue. But you really had to go a long way to find glomeruli like that. It was IgG positive, IgM positive, and C3 positive. And by electron microscopy, you could see these large subepithelial deposits of immune complexes. We're still working on the pathogenesis. This is another condition that occurs in a fairly high percentage of hamsters. This is amyloidosis in a hamster. Notice the irregular surface. On the cut surface, it would have looked brown. This is a dog, and it has that yellowish look that amyloid often does but the hamster doesn't look like that. The deposits of the material, the amyloid, were, were almost segmental and doesn't look anything like that. Last case I showed you, the immune complex disease, at least in the distribution of the lesion. A lot of protein cast in the tubule. And if you suspect that it's amyloid, you know, you do your H and E, you do your Congo red and it's positive, then you put your polarizer on and you see if it polarizes and forms an apple green fluorescence, and it does. And if you're a purist, you go ahead and do electron microscopy and look for a specific periodicity of amyloid. This is a better, better photomicrograph of the apple green fluorescence that's unique to amyloid. It's a Congo red stain. And here's, here's, some info, here's some data that I got several years ago comparing two different strains of hamsters on lifespan. We, at one time at the National Toxicology Program, we were, we were considering using hamsters more for toxicity work. We did not decide to do that, and this is the reason why, actually. The mean lifespan in this strain was 108 weeks, whereas in this strain it was 90. Hard to do a two-year bioassay in those animals. If you, if you kind of, if you look down and see why, these animals live longer, 
this is the reason right here, zero, 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 for amyloidosis versus these figures, notice which have a sex predisposition, higher in females, lower in males. And uh, that's enough to kill them. And, uh, and definitely don't want those kind of kidneys if you're, if you're trying to test a chemical that might be voided through the urine. Notice that uh, the incidence was very high in the kidney and fairly high in the liver and the adrenal gland. Basically, generalized amyloidosis, microscopically speaking, can be seen in almost any organ. These are, are things other than amyloid that, that have a big factor in lifespan of, of hamsters. There's a condition, nephrosis, similar to the rat nephropathy or the nephropathy of the B6C3F1 mouse, but, but more of, of a protein losing enteropathy, I mean uh, renal disease. And um, y you can see it, has a, it had a higher incidence than the one that, that did live longer, but it w obviously wasn't death causing. The, another condition in hamsters is heart, is thrombosis of the heart, usually the right age. And uh, thrombosis can be seen in a number of different places in the, in the hamster. And if you think about diseases like salmonellosis, there are more thrombotic events with salmonellosis in the hamster than in the guinea pig or the rat or the mouse. So there, uh, there could, be, could be something unique about the clotting functions in the ham hamster. That's, 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 worth a, that's worth a small research project. And also notice that um, in addition to the non-neoplastic events, look at the incidence of the adrenal tumors and lymphomas in this strain versus this one. No lymphomas at all in this group. Very important that in toxicology that you define the animal that you're working with. We, we do a lot of work in transgenic science, and I, I try to stress to the investigators that I must know what the background lesions are and the parent strain of the animal that they made the transgenic from. That's going to have a big impact on my interpretation of the data on a genetic-induced event. And that, that lung lesion I talked about a while ago is a good example of that. Or how common lung tumors are. That's another, that, was, that, that turned out to be a, a major factor just recently. This is the uh, nephropathy of the rat. Um, this is brown fat, which uh, rodents have. And uh, that's, that's one of the several locations that you see it. Notice that the, the kidney has got a lot of scar, and scar tissue in it and uh, appears irregular on the surface. And classically, it, it, it ranges from anything from just simple regeneration of tubules up to a full-blown case with lots of cast and mineral dilated tubules, and inflammatory response in the interstitium and the tubules. And the, if the glomeruli are involved, it's, it's usually due to basic membrane disease or to ischemic changes that can occur in the glomerulus secondary to the uh, vascular embarrassment in the interstitium. Re tubular regeneration in early tox studies is a, is a real problem. If you see this in control, and you also see it in the dose animal, you have a little bit of an interpretation problem. And I actually have a category called exaggerated nephropathy as a chemically induced event. And we've shown that to be true in a number of different studies. You can see why these were sometimes described in the old literature as colloid kidneys had these large dilated tubules full of eosinophilic proteinaceous material. A nephropathy of the type I've just described is not unique just to the rat. This is a B6C3F1 mouse, and this is one of many that we saw. An interstitial infiltrate dilated tubule presence of cast with regeneration. In fact, this is a 90-day study in a control this is a good example of a regenerative tubule. Where there's regeneration, there had to be degeneration or necrosis. Subtle, but, in, but incomplete. And 
just keep that in mind that, that rats are not the only ones that develop this nephropathy syndrome. These are bacterial and fungal causes of urinary disease in the mouth. There have been several good cases in the literature in, in, the, in the journal Laboratory Animal Science and Infection and Immunity on natural outbreaks of Proteus mirabilis and the renal involvement with that agent. It causes a papillary necrosis and pyelonephritis. Best paper described by Bob Marimpo. Almost 15 years ago. Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus aureus, Trinibacterium cutri, and Pastorella and Candida tropicalis are all organisms that can cause renal disease in the mouth. This is uh, one of the animals from uh, Marin Poe's outbreak. And uh, you can see that the, both kidneys are involved. They had this yellowish yellowish, uh, patchy uh, lesions that are almost diffuse, and uh, there, there's some variation in the surface on these kidneys. Some, some appear to be either shrunken or enlarged. On cut surface, uh, you, can still, you, can, you can still see the yellowish areas like this one here. And here's the papillary necrosis. And all, all of the polymorphic nuclear leukocytes and necrosis from the renal pelvis would point towards a primary pyelonephritis. Might point out that the experimental procedure can precipitate this type of event. Several years ago, I had news mice that were had human tumors xenografts subcutaneously. And we started losing them about seven or eight months after their initial implant. In every case, the tumor was a breast carcinoma for women. In those, in those cases, we always supplemented the nude mouth with subcutaneous estrogen. There are several ways to do that. But one of the ways to do it is to put a pellet or a microserial coated with estrogen in the subcutis. And it's designed to dissolve in approximately 45 to 60 days. Based on that, you can figure picograms per animal per day. And if it exceeds that, then you're, eating, re you're uh, reaching a toxic event. In this case, what happened was the animal got developed hyperestrogenism. It opened the os of the cervix, and fecal contamination occurred that way, and the animal developed hyalometra. And it was a common bacterial agent that occurs normally in the digestive of the new mouse, but became a pathogen because of the circumstances caused by the experiment. Well, we, we left with pyelonephritis. Let's go to a uh, different type of kidney lesion, that being uh, acute tuberculosis in the, in the mouse due to Trinibacterium cutra. This is from that outbreak that I described. Uh, we found uh, pyogranulomas abscesses in uh, almost every tissue in the body, including the testis and in the feet in the, in a true cotodermatitis, which I believe ne neither one of those two organ sites that have been described in the open literature for this disease. Pseudotuberculosis is confusing to some, sometimes to the people that are studying for the laboratory animal medicine boards because it's a uh, it, depending on which animal species you're talking about, it can be a different organism. In rats and mice, it is Trinibacterium cutri. In guinea pigs and rabbits, it's Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. And then it really gets complicated in primates. They can get all three. Or they don't get Trinibacterium cutri, but they do get Yersinia pseudotuberculosis 
Yersinia enteropolitica and Carinobacterium fulvus. All those have been reported in the literature over the years. This is a uh, subgross section of a kidney cut in longitudinal plane to show uh, the open spaces that occur with this disease. It's not a cystic lesion. The lesions are small, but they do have uh, a lot of little holes. And microscopically, what you're looking at are the protozoal stages of Clostridium urus in the kidney of the mouse. And these are dilated tubules with the organism in them, like this, similar to that seen in horse. This is another protozoal agent that occurs in rats and mice and rabbits um, and other animals as well. Man has its own form now. Encephalozoon. In the, ra in the rabbit, it's called encephalozoon funiculi. And it classically causes lesions in the brain and kidney. Here are these little punctate scars are um, what you usually see. And it, if you're checking vendors for quality of rabbit, this is one of the things you always check. A good necropsy should be part of a quality assessment interpretation. There are some diagnostic tests now, a LISA methodology for encephalozoonosis. Here's a... Uh, Here's another uh, kidney from uh, another, I mean another case of rabbit with encephalozoonosis to show a more extensive involvement with fissures and scars. This classically in microscopically is an interstitial disease. Well, it starts out as a tubular disease and then the, with the tube wall of the tubules break down and you get leakage into the interstitium and then a chemotactic response and an interstitial uh, nephritis. This is uh, what it looks like before the cyst breaks. You can see these little organisms in here from encephalozoon. And then in the brain, we'll talk about that later when we talk about neurological disease. This is a rat, and in the, in the urinary space next to the papilla are these structures here. And uh, you can see adults in the urinary space. These are cross sections of a nematode. And you can see the organisms are present in the transitional epithelium as long as, uh, where also the eggs are found. Here, they, here, the or, here the nematode is found in the transitional epithelium. And here's a good example of the brown pigment that's seen in these eggs. Not too many metazoan parasites have brown eggs. This is one of them. This is Trichosomoides crossicata. Probably been uh, personally responsible for more repeat studies of sugar substitutes in the history of our nation. The original study on a sugar substitute was kicked out because they later found Trichosomoides crossicata in the, in the tissues. So the question came up, did the worm cause the lesions or did the agent cause the lesions or was it a combined effect? Good point, and it's good reason to use clean animals. This is a nice example of urolithiasis in the bladder or cystic urolithiasis in a rat. These kinds of uh, products can be multiple, singular, smooth, or rough. Here's another case in the urinary bladder. Now notice in this case that there's a, this is a ureter. Here's a ureter on this side that's dilated. So you have a hydro ureter. The, the 
right in the middle of this kidney is a staghorn calculus. So you've got a calculus, you've got, you've got a calculus in this kidney, you've got a hydrourethra, and you've got urolithiasis to the bladder or cystic urolithiasis. Nice slide for an examination. And this is a good example of a staghorn calculus in a rabbit. And here's a case that we had not too long ago at our place where there was hydrourethra, and the kidney was irregular in shape in this rabbit. And it had large cavitation in the middle of it. And um, the presence of some material in the, in the cavity that appeared to be uh, granular in te texture, we started looking for reasons uh, why this might be dilated, the hydrogen pressure. If I have one more wire tied to me, I'm gonna feel hog tied. This is a uh, higher magnification to show this tubular calculus. Now at this point, it's probably dystrophic calcification. In the rat, there's a lesion that's commonly seen in females more than males, uh, right above the cortical medullary junction and you see these dilated tubules, and sometimes the way you catch on that there's something there is you'll see tears in the tissue due to the microtome having difficulty getting through these small rocks. Uh, urolithiasis is, uh, can be seen as early as 90 days of age in, ra in rats, but it's, it's uh, much more of a problem in, in older animals. And most of the time is limited to the to this region or slightly lower down in the collecting tubules. Here they are, the, they show these laminated rings. See this piece right here that you can see laminar laminations. And they stain positive with the von Kassa stain and with the alizarin red for calcium. The cause of this condition in rats has been debated for years. One of the classic papers was by Carol Woodard on this. And the, the present thinking in the last two to three years has been that it's tied to estrogen rather than to calcium phosphorus metabolism so much, which would explain why it's in a higher incidence in females. But they've done studies where they've castrated males and given them estrogen and they produce this change. So there, there's probably something to that. Now, papillary necrosis or mineralization of the papilla is another type of lesion is seen in the rat. 
it's usually associated with some previous injury to the collecting ducts. And I've seen this a number of times with chemicals that were given one dose and then, then or the doses were scattered far enough apart that you got some healing in between the dose exposures. Of course, there are some chemical compounds in the pharmaceutical industry that cause papillary necrosis, and we know those in the horse and so on. But in the rat, if you get much more mineral than this, you're, you're going to lose that papilla. In the guinea pig, they, this is a normal guinea pig on the right, or normal kidney, and this is an animal that hasn't, isn't very old, but has polycystic renal disease. As a hereditary disease, it also occurs in hamsters, but in that case, the, am the animals have cysts and other organs too, especially the liver. This is a rat kidney and it has a tumor at one end and that is usually the case. Renal tubular tumors, more often than not, occur at one pole or the other. It's very important when you're trimming tissues. If you, a lot of people, including our laboratory, routinely cut the left kidney longitudinal and the right kidney on cross-section through the renal pillow that cross-section through the middle will definitely not show the early renal tubular hyperplasias that are seen when compounds induce renal tubular neoplasia. There is a continuum from hyperplasia to adenoma to carcinoma. It's not always there. It depends on the chemical makeup. But there, it, there usually is a continuum. This is a uh, This is an example of a adenoma arising from the renal tubule that's in the cortex of a Fisher 344 rat. As this thing gets larger, often they form vacuolated cells and look like this, or they can be solid, depending on the cell type. This is a pretty large tumor. This is a H&E section of kidney from a Fisher rat that was given trichloroethylene. Notice that there's dilated tubules with the presence of necrotic debris in the tubule, some hemorrhage here and there, but the really dramatic change of the presence of these large nuclei. This is a good example of a drug-induced or chemically-induced karyomegaly. And Trichloroethylene is a, is a good example of a compound that produces that type of change. Here's a higher power to show the enormous size of these nuclei compared to normal nuclei over here. There appears to be an association between compounds that cause karyomegaly of the kidney and those that cause renal tubular neoplasia. In trichloroethylene, there was also another change called atypical tubular dilatation. It was a, it was, we, we came up with that term for this study because it was different. We'd never seen anything like it, and I, I can't remember having seen anything like it since. Most of the time when you get tubules that are dilated in, in this type of a renal disease, they're longitudinal. This one, they were longitudinal and running the other way too. And that, this was a very common finding with this, comp with this compound. Also notice that some of it, it almost looks like alveoli in the lung and that there are walls that are, that are, are septi that stick out here and then are broken. Here's another one. Um, it's just different. So atypical tubular dilatation is, is the term that the United States government put on that lesion. Here's another. Uh, larger cell too. 
And uh, this was a uh, another renal cell tumor of a mesenchymal type. And uh, in the ILSI text, they, they describe this mesenchymal, meso, mesenchoma type lesion as being as arising from the uh, stroma. Uh, I've only seen one case. This was a nude mouse, and uh, it was this was not seen on the gross because at, we had a policy at that time to uh, to tie off the uh, the ureters going into the bladder, and to inject formalin direct directly into the bladder, and then after it's fixed, open it up. If you want to uh, not damage the surface, that's the best way to do it. Well, in the process of doing that, uh, when we went back to trim the tissues, we found this. That's a large neoplasm for a nude mouse urinary bladder. You see it's, on, it's a large mass, but it's on one stalk right here. Here's the stalk, and there's, infl there's an inflammatory infiltrate in the stalk. This was a uh, papilloma in the arising from transitional cell origin in the nude mouse. Look at the mitotic figures in this one. It's, uh, it's growing fast, but it was non-invasive. It was invading into the, took the line of least resistance into the, into the cavity of the bladder. Here's a rabbit with uh, hematuria, a lot of blood, tinged fluid, in, in, or urine in the bladder, and uh, a normal kidney over here and an abnormal kidney over here. <coughs> and this is what it looked like when we cut into it. There's a, there was a rim of tissue along the edge in this big cavitation. So we, we, took t we took tissue from here and from here for microscopic evaluation. Before we did that, we took a radiograph of it, and lo and behold, the radiograph was much denser than I thought it should be. And a smaller portion of the s samples looked at had this lobular or uh, glandular pattern that form islands of cells. But even in those areas where they're it formed uh, epithelioid appearing cells. There was no mitotic figures. And in between, there was this pink eosinophilic material that uh, looked like bone or osteoid. And this is a, a Luzerin red stained section under polarized light. And it shows that it was a calcium matrix and that it was dense and biofringent. So you run, you run into a problem on one like this. Is it a renal cell carcinoma, a nephroblastoma, or the, a mesenchymal tumor that's been described briefly by Ron Flatt in the rabbit kidney? Um, we went with nephroblastoma for one reason. Um, it was a slow-growing tumor. It was non-invasive, did not metastasize, no mitotic figures, no no really good examples of invasion. And um, it did not have good glomerular formation like a nephroblastoma should. But our, our physician friends at Baylor said, well, we see those all the time in man with no glomerular formation, and we still call them nephroblastomas. So uh, based on the fact that the nephroblastoma is a very common tumor of the rabbit, uh, you've got to go with the odds. The next subject is genital diseases. The guinea pig has a lot of uh, cystic lesions, and one of the one of the places they see cysts in, in, in old guinea pigs is in the ovaries. The the difference though is that uh, in the guinea pig it's classically cystic reti. That's not true in mice and rats. 
uh, they don't have to be bilateral. They can be unilateral, and I've seen them the size of a softball. Assist is assist. They're just uh, dil they're dilated areas. Uh, some hemocytor and pigment where you put enough pressure on the adjacent tissue, you get some hemorrhage. Several years ago, um, the National Toxicology Program had several studies on tests, and we started losing animals from abscesses in the ovary and abscesses that, or that started in the ovary and then broke and caused suppurative peritonitis in, uh, in these animals. They were in B6C3F1 mice. And we cultured, in every case, Klebsiella oxytoca from, from these cases. The interesting thing about it, though, was that it, only, it, didn't, it did not occur before seven months into the experiment in every case. So why? Well, one of the correlations is that that's about the same time that she starts, somewhere around seven, eight, nine months, is about the same time that you see cystic glandular, endo, endometrial cystic glandular hyperplasia in the mouse. And if you go to those lesions, go to the animals that had those lesions, you'd find little microabscesses in the dilated glands. So it's uh, reasonable to think then that you could get an ascending infection from there back up to the, to the ovary. And we think that's what happened. And that's what this is, this multiple abscesses, but there's also a dilatation in the, in the uterus. And that was cystic glandular hyperplasia. And the abscesses just like, look like any other abscess, but uh, they were enormous in size. This is segmental aplasia of the uterine horn. It's one of the hereditary diseases that you see in ger geriatric studies of guinea pigs. You can have complete loss of the horn, like in this rat. Uh, you see a large cyst here, one horn. There's the other ovary, but Nothing, nothing but a little bit of connective tissue holding it in place. One of my veterinary clinicians was asked by one of the principal investigators that did transgenic work if he might examine this mouse because they were having a hard time getting her to breed. She had uh, her uh, external orifice on the, in the vagina was sealed shut. And uh, that had resulted in a tremendous hydrometra or mucometra in this animal. So she wasn't a very good candidate for breeding. Times have changed about how you handle cases like this from a clinical standpoint. 20 years ago, if you had an animal that was ill, and it was a mouse, and it was in a room with 400 other mice, it wasn't unusual to kill the mouse because it was a source of infection for the others. And you may or may not do a necropsy on the mouse, but that's pretty common nowadays. We, uh, we have people that are on call in the evenings for clinical uh, rounds in mice because these transgenic mice are worth three to six thousand dollars each. That's more than any cow or horse I worked on in private practice. <laughs> we have transgenic rabbits that are just the labor in the in the prep in the making of that rabbit was over fifty thousand dollars. We we actually have rabbits that are insured by the investigator through Lloyd's of London for over fifty thousand dollars per rabbit. And um, they don't breed too well, but they're extremely valuable if you're interested in doing atherosclerosis research, which is what they do with these. But it's changed the way that laboratory animal vet veterinarians have to look at the care of these animals.
this is a, a fisher rat female, and it's a good example of a stromal polyp. They, when you, you, you'll feel them on the gross, you'll see a, a little out pocketing there, and you feel them, and it, you feel something that's firm, and when you cut into it, this is what you see, and if you very gently pull it out, you'll find that it's on a stalk. It's attached, and they can become malignant. Here's, here's a case where that stromal polyp turned into be a sarcoma. Uh, don't ever, don't forget that the uterus can be a target organ for lymphomas in mice. In fact, for certain types of lymphomas, it's the first place you see it. This was a lymphoblastic lymphoma, which is the most common one I see in our P53 uh, tumor suppressor gene studies. This is a rabbit with a, a large neoplasm down here in the horn. And uh, this turned out to be a very solid tumor. And it was a adenocarcinoma of the uterus, which is a not uncommon tumor of the rabbit. We've seen several of them in the four years I've been at Baylor. Here's another case. In fact, this, this animal had multiple tumors. We thought uh, this last rabbit case, uh, we had had a metastasis to the kidney, but it uh, turned out to be this was a renal tubular adenoma. So act, this rabbit had two tumors. That's not too common. This animal, uh, we thought, uh, had a hernia, but uh, that's hard to diagnose in an animal that has an open inguinal ring. And the testis normally uh, can go from the outside or to the inside, depending on the body, the, the temperature of the room and the body temperature of the animal. But it, sacs of this type aren't supposed to have intestines in them. This was, in fact, a hernia. Anytime you have swellings in back in this region, you have to think of that, as well as neoplasia and uh, other inflammatory disease. I put this slide in here today for one reason. This slide was on the ACVP examination when I, when I took it, and I kept looking for the lesion because I necropsied 5,000 guinea pigs at Pine Bluff Arsenal and knew that seminal vesicles in the male looked like this. But that was the answer. This is, if you've never, if you've never looked at a male guinea pig, the seminal vesicle is enormous. And, but it's bilateral, and other than that, there's nothing wrong with it. This is a normal. This is the normal testis from a Fisher 344 rat, and this is an abnormal one. The Fisher 344 rat commonly gets one or multiple interstitial cell tumors of the testis. It's one of the most common neoplasms in the Fisher rat. They get other types of neoplasms in the testis, but they're rare compared to this one. This is the latex cell or interstitial cell adenoma. Now here's another rat that has mesothelioma, which is another common tumor of the Fisher rat. But notice this testicle, which is inside the inguinal ring, also has these multiple yellow foci, which are the interstitial cell tumors in the testis. So this, this animal's got two tumors. Mesotheliomas in the Fisher rat are thought to arise from the testis area. In fact, that's, that's what that is right there. If you uh, have a lot of this material and you want to look at it better underneath a dissecting scope, one way to do it is to put it in, fixed in, in formalin and then go back and look at it after it's hardened. And that's what we did with this. You can see this uh, lumpy, bumpy, appearance that you see with these. It's interesting to me that with uh, immunohistochemistry ex exploding like it has in the last four or five years, that no one has come up 
with a specific monoclonal antibody to mesothelioma yet. One of the biggest problems still in human medicine is how to differentiate mesotheliomas from other carcinomas, either primary or metastatic, that occur in the thorax or in the lung proper. Basically, the way they do it is by default. If it's negative for every, if it's negative for the carcinoma, immuno, you know, monoclonal antibodies, then it might be a mesothelioma. I've been told in the last month that there are two antibodies that are being, have been made and are being tested at, the, at this time, but I haven't seen them yet. It's a very difficult tumor to diagnose if that's, if that's what, uh, the way you're going about it. Let's talk about alimentary diseases, minus the liver. Uh, let's start out with the mouth. Um, this is a rabbit with malocclusion of the incisor teeth. Um, animals that are kept in captivity for long periods of time, especially on artificial diets, have to be examined closely. And one of the things that you should do is look at their teeth. If their teeth are overgrowing, then you should snip them back a little bit. And uh, that's a fairly common procedure in rabbits, especially uh, polyclonal antibody production rabbits that are kept around for two years at a time. You also have to watch their weight. And uh, we give them the calculated uh, amount of food for their weight rather than free access ad lib diets. And that uh, they, feel, they feel better, they, ha they have less lesions at, at the end of two years, and they, they handle the procedure better. Here's a guinea pig, and the animal can't get its teeth, its incisors together because the, there's malocclusion of the back teeth, the molars. That's fairly common in guinea pigs. And uh, the term silism, which uh, you hear describing slobbers in the guinea pig, um, most, most often people will think of the less common things like fluorosis that would cause that in a guinea pig, when in fact uh, this is the most common cause. Here's a guinea pig that has uh, okay teeth up here and one tooth down here that's growing real fast. So that's one you'd have to trim back. And here's a mouse with the same kind of problem. You've got to be a little careful if you start seeing a lot of this type of a problem. It may be due to the transgenic procedure that they're doing. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a good example of that near the end. Here's a rat that uh, has a photophobia and has a little bit of a discharge around the eye and the nose, a little bit. And it, the side of the face is somewhat swollen. You can't appreciate it until you look down, down the side. And then you see this big swelling. And this is SDAV virus in the rat, Cylodacaradenitis virus. It's a inflammatory disease of viral origin that affects both lacrimal glands and the salivary gland. And that this is what it looks like. It's a very hypercellular in inflammatory infiltrate in the ducts and interstitium of the gland proper with debris out in the, the, the asini of the glands. Another virus disease that can do this is salivary gland viral disease, or cytomegalovirus. Cytomegaloviruses are unique in that they um, are antigenically distinct for the animal that it's in. Guinea pigs get guinea pig cytomegalovirus, and you can't, it, you can't give a disease to the mouse by injecting it back in from the guinea pig into the mouth. They seem to be specific for the strains. It's also one of those uh, viruses that can cause both intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. And here's a good example of uh, intranuclear inclusion bodies in the salivary gland of a guinea pig. This is a very fairly common disease of pregnant guinea pigs, especially near term, uh, last two or three days before they deliver. They'll die, and when you do the necropsy and collect the tissues, 
this is what they died of. I had a, I showed a case here at the National Capital Area Branch, a last meeting back in the 70s. Of it, I think we found inclusion bodies in 12 organs. It was, uh, I'd say, generalized. Here's, an, here's another case uh, in, a, in a duct in the salivary gland. This is the stomach of a guinea pig, and notice this uh, crusty material on the surface. It's an irregular surface, or an irregular surface on this, in this stomach. Um, I mentioned earlier, when, right at the beginning, on, uh, when we were talking about hearts, that guinea pigs get a metastatic calcification. Uh, there was a large outbreak uh, here back in the 60s, and um, it killed a number of animals, and th that paper was published in Lab Animal Science. And this, is the, this was the distribution of the, le of the lesion in these organs, and you see 100% in the kidney, 27% on the greater curvature of the stomach. And then, but look at all the other tissues that it occurred in. That's a classically metastatic calcification in its best sense in that it's generalized like that. And this was the one I told you that was a hypomagnesemia. It was interesting because these guinea pigs were Hartley albinos that were shipped from my facility in Arkansas to Aberdeen Proving Ground. And we'd never seen this in our animals. In, uh, in, in a year that I'd been there. And so it was obviously, it was obviously diet, but uh, they, they had to work out the chemical composition of the diet to, before they were comfortable with that diagnosis. This was a three, three of about 30 hamsters that died over a period of a week at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in the 70s. And um, they all looked alike. They had this, this tremendous hemorrhagic lesion in the, in the great, the, the large intestine and cecum. And um, they, other than that, they had a ne you know, necrohemorrhagic lesion microscopically, but we couldn't isolate the cause. Um, just, so, just by happenstance that it, this was about the same time that they had a problem like this in England, and they isolated a uh, specific form of E. coli. And that was this O. serotype 117. We went back and checked our animals for it, and that's what they died of. So this, this, the, the example I just showed you was a cholebacillosis. But if you had a reddened necrotic intestinal intestine in a hamster, you'd have to consider all these things in your differential. Um, including Campylobacter, and if it if it had these proliferative lesions, especially down the ileum with these outpocketing outpockets, then you'd have to definitely think Campylobacter. They're still working on the pathogenesis of this disease, and, and they're, even the people that are most actively involved with it, research-wise, argue back and forth between each other as to what the cause really is. I think it's uh, usually when that's the case, it's more than one cause. This is a guinea pig uh, with hemorrhages in the intestine, and it, this was due to salmonella. Chronic salmonellosis in the guinea pig is a bad disease. It starts, it starts in a colony one animal at a time until it's, there aren't any animals left. And this may take 90 days, or it may take six months. It's uh, depending how astute your animal care staff is and how, how many veterinarians you have around to help diagnose it. But this is, uh, this, this is from a natural outbreak, these slides right here. And they, this, the spleen showed these areas of necrosis, and there were areas in the liver like this, and uh, that, get that intestinal lesion. Here's the, here's the lesion in the liver and fixed tissue. So that, that's, that was all salmonella, but it was chronic salmonellosis. Uh, acute salmonellosis has been reported in the guinea pig. And uh, I believe it was salmonella lamiti that did that. This is a fairly common disease in rabbits, and it's 
mucoid enteropathy or enteritis. And uh, the animal usually has a history of found dead. And when you do open them up at necropsy, you see a dilated intestine like this full of mucus. And uh, this one looks more like mucus filled. And they have a lot of gas in them, the bubbles like this. So uh, again, it's one of those diseases we don't, we, it's been around forever, but no one's really come up with a, a cause that, that uh, fulfills Koch's postulate. The, you can do things like modify the diet and, and usually keep it from getting worse in your colony. But uh, I haven't, I've never been in a place yet that we didn't see some of this disease from time to time. I used to say the same thing about this, but um, I'm getting, I'm seeing, actually seeing less of it. This is, this is uh, Clostridium spiriformi, but it's a good example of the paintbrush hemorrhages that have been described with this in the Enron. This is associated with an iota toxin. And whenever you have diarrhea in a rabbit, you need to think of simple things first. And coccidiosis in the intestine is, is still a very common uh, problem among rabbits. Way back when, uh, a veterinary pathologist described this disease called spontaneous ileitis of the rat. And cause unknown. And um, a similar disease had been reported as proliferative ileitis of the rat with implications that it might be a neoplastic event. And uh, the same person that published, or at least co-authored the paper on this spontaneous ileitis kept the tissues and years later, after we knew more about scissors disease, went, he went back to the wet tissues and did uh, silver stains and found the organism. So this was in fact scissors. That we just didn't, he didn't know it at, at that time. About 10 years went by before he confirmed that. But I give him a lot of credit for going back and checking. Dilated ileum was the big thing seen with this disease. Scissors disease can vary between animal species tremendously. This is a <coughs> Worthy, Worth and Star stain to uh, show the pickup stick appearance of the titters bacillus. Can you focus that? Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Thank you very much. These are the causes of diarrhea in the mouse, uh, or some of them. The Cit Citrobacter frundii biotype type 4280 is one of the causes of diarrhea. Salmonellosis, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Uh, Tizzer's disease, mouse rotavirus infection. Mouse coronavirus infection, you notice I called it that rather than mouse hepatitis virus. I think the preferred term today is mouse coronavirus infection. Real virus 3 infection, or coccidiosis, spironucleosis, helminths of various kinds, and dietary factors. Here's an animal that has an enlarged abdomen, and um, that could be caused from about, just about from anything. Um, I routinely ask my pathology residents what, or my laboratory animal medicine residents, what might cause this, and uh, 
eight out, of, eight out of 10 times they forget pregnancy. I have three kids, so I didn't forget that one. But an enlarged abdomen um, can be caused by a lot of things. And I'm, I know what's going through your mind. You're trying to think about all those things that you, that you know might cause this. But when we open this one up, this is what we found. It's a gas-filled intestine and stomach. We never did find a good reason for it. There was no impingement that we could identify. Um, I just think that he probably ate at one of those fast food places he shouldn't have. Now here's a rat. This was a case that we had just a few months ago. And the animal had a distended abdomen. And on the gross had a distended stomach and if you'll notice all of this kind of a finely granular appearance to the surface of the intestinal tract, there's also some adhesions right here, very small adhesions. So this animal had a peritonitis, or at least uh, something going on in the abdominal cavity that turned on fibrin. If you, if you take this and reflect it back, then you can see the dilated stomach and primarily the duodenum and ileum. So you say, is that a ileus? Well, that, that should be in your differential. What classically causes an ileus? Well, one of the things that causes it is chloral hydrate. This animal had been injected. This is one of 60 that died. They're all injected for the same purpose, and that was to draw blood samples. And there were three, tech, were three graduate students in there drawing the blood samples. But they died before they ever had a chance to draw the blood sample. The sedative was Avertin, or Avertin, depending on how you pronounce it. And what happened was that the ones that did survive had the fiber, the ones that didn't you know, it's too acute. But we think that the concentration that they mixed the Averton up, you know, into was uh, definitely super concentrated, that they, that they missed their calculation when they fixed it. Averton does not work well if it's been sitting around for per extended periods of time. It's one of those um, anesthetics that you have to mix up fresh. So for some reason, it's a real popular drug, and uh, a lot of the people in the British Isles use it. A lot of the people that were trained in transgenic science on the East Coast, especially in the Massachusetts area, use this. And those people migrated to, te to Texas and went to work in the cell biology department and uh, I inherited their problem. But I think there really was an alias there, probably due to the fact that the, the, there was less flexibility for the stomach and intestine to be able to move around in. It didn't slip and slide, it just kind of hung in there. This was a, a microscopic section of the liver surface to show this fibrin. And um, this was uh, John Durfee that works for me. Um, he, did, he made these slides, pretty nifty idea here. He, he took a normal stomach from the rat, from another rat, and took a picture of it. And then he went over here and tried to put the same amount of stomach over here. And that you can see that we're looking at maybe a third of the circumference of the stomach in the affected animal versus the normal. So there was quite a lot of dilatation. Also, look, look at the blending of the mucosa compared to here. Get that much pressure behind it. That's what caused that, most likely. And here's the intestine. He did the same thing. This is normal duodenum with, with the pancreas, and this is the affected animal. This is a uh, rabbit stomach. And it's still one of, the, one of the problems that we see from time to time, depending on uh, the source of food. This is a trichobezoar in the stomach of a rabbit from uh, either the diet or excessive grooming, and they get hair in their stomach or a combination of both in some, in some time. 
This is a nude mouse stomach, and it's a nice example of the limiting ridge right here, which demarcates the glandular from the non-glandular stomach. And at one end of the stomach was this white raised structure that looked like an egg. When we incised it, cut it in half, you can see that the wall of the stomach is very thin here, and then there's another, there's another petition right here, and then there's, some, there's this material that's over here in this portion of it, which is the part we saw that was raised. What this turned out to be was an epidermal inclusion cyst, or inclusion cyst, not arising from skin, but arising from squamous epithelium. It was just an outpocket in the formation of this keratin. And the more it produced, the bigger the cyst got. A similar type thing occurs in, in papillomas of the stomach and the rat. They, they develop, in this case though, they develop fronds, but they can get quite large. In the colon of the rat, one, one of the types of tumors that occurs is this polypoid adenocarcinoma. And it, you can get one or multiple, depending on the circumstance. Thank you, doctor. This is one of the lesions, and it's a polypoid, it's a one polyp. And uh, we'll see how good you are at recognition of things. This is a, uh, a hyperactive surface something going on here, but there's a pinworm right there, cutting cross-section. And here's a, one of the hallmarks for calling this malignant, is the, is the invasion of the stalk that the tumor's on. And so this one was considered to be an adenocarcinoma. This is a mouse, a Bob C. mouse, that was an antibody production animal. And the, the hibernomas that are used to produce the antibodies uh, vary a lot in their, in their cell type and their texture and how the host responds to it. What you hope will happen is that you inject the hibernoma and it will form a solid tumor or multiple solid tumors and uh, be secretory in its action and you'll be able to tap the animal to draw off the ascites and maybe three times in one week, and then that's we, we end the experiment. And if if that's the case, if they're solid, if they're solid tumors, when you tilt the animal's head down and push past the needle through uh, close to the inguinal canal, you will get a nice clean stick, and you can draw the ascites fluid back into the syringe very easily without sticking it into the intestine and contaminating the, so, to the sample. And if you're away from the tumor, and you can tell, you can tell that, but whether the ascites comes e easy or not, you can rotate the, the, the bevel of the needle and get away from the solid tumor, and it will start filling again. But every once in a while, you'll have one like this one that no matter where you put the needle, you can't get very much ascites. And when you open them up, you find this kind of a velvety proliferation over the serosal surfaces of all of the abdominal organs. And invariably, those are colonic carcinoma cell lines. Well, this one was just that. It was a colonic carcinoma cell line. There wasn't a lot we could do to draw good ascites samples for monoclonal antibody production. But what we did find out was that no matter that if you gave the same dose of cells from the hibernoma to the to the bowel sea mouse, they would get this lesion to this extent in a predicted time frame, and it would usually ultimately end up in their death if we didn't euthanize them beforehand. So we decided to take a bad thing and make it work for us, and we used this as an animal model to test those kinds of cancer, theme of pure, uh, cancer drugs that you would treat seeding of colonic carcinomas in man, which is a big problem, or more importantly, 
ovarian tumors in women, where they break out of the ovary and seed all over the abdominal cavity. Usually by the time that happens, the prognosis is extremely poor. So we're looking for ways that we can inject something into the abdomen to treat those really severe cases of cancer. And the two, the two drugs of choice right now are immunoconjugants or immunotoxins. We found that using this model, we can at least extend life and use that as the baseline to establish dosages for these drugs. And it's a nice reproducible model, but it's a colonic carcinoma cell line. So that's a carcinomatosis model. Well, let's talk about liver diseases. This is a guinea pig with uh, fatty change in the liver. And if it's diffuse like this, uh, one of the things you'd like to ask in your clinical workup is, was she pregnant? And because uh, this is a, is a, a nice example of pregnancy toxemia in the guinea pig. Rabbits also get this, and sheep get it. Here's a case in a sheep. Can we focus that, please? Thank you. Um, the, the, the capsule of the liver is a little thicker on the, rat, on the rabbit than it is on some of the other species. And the older the animal gets, the, more, the, the thicker it gets. Sometimes that uh, does not make for good photographs because it, it uh, is reflective. But fatty livers uh, do occur in the, in the rabbit with pregnancy toxin. Guinea pigs also develop a biliary cyst like this. They can be in the primary bile duct or they can be up in the first radical that goes into the liver. Fairly common in geriatric uh, necropsies of guinea pigs. bacterium cuturi, and then later on it was uh, described, used to describe feline infectious peritonitis. And it's uh, probably overused today, but it, uh, it's a very descriptive lesion if used right. Fibrosis on the gross examination can be seen, uh, as well as bile duct lesions, if you think of hepatic coccidiosis in the rabbit, and various types of cellular infiltrates, especially leukemias. <coughs> this is a fairly close cropped photograph of a mouse, and it shows the several things, actually. It shows a swollen liver, and the liver has multifocal yellow spots in the liver. There's also splenomegaly. So it's hepatosplenomegaly with focal necrosis in the liver or necrotizing hepatitis. Now what can cause that in a mouse? It can be caused by mouse hepatitis virus, mouse pox, Rio 3, lymphocytic choromeningitis, tissers, salmonella, and other bacteria, which I'll show you in a minute. And under experimental conditions, by that meaning those investigators that dip down in their freezer and pull out a sample that was there, they put in there 15, 20 years prior, uh, it may, that may be the source of this ectomelia outbreak like it was at NIH one time. Or it could be, if they take that sample out and then propagate it in the cell lines, then they beef up the sample and the, the infectious agent with it, and, they can, and murine cytomegalovirus, Rio2, and K virus have been shown to uh, cause problems under those kind of conditions. <coughs> this is a long list of pathogenic bacteria in mice. It's um, a, a, a mini report of Berkey's manual, but it's, it's, it does show a lot of important agents that we think are, are, are problems today in laboratory animal pathology some of them more important than others. Passerella pneumotropica, I think, is much more important than, than it's, been, it's been given credit for, uh, especially as a cause of subcutaneous abscesses in mice, and um, I, I believe as a, a source of problems in reproductive disorders. Uh, salmonella, we'll talk about more, but there are pathogenic E. coli that, are, that are, can cause grief to an animal facility, and all of these things can cause focal necrosis in the liver under the right set of conditions.
this uh, sample that we saw a while ago with the hepatosplenomegaly and the focal areas of necrosis in the liver, this is the microscopic from that animal, and it's a good example of acute coagulative necrosis in the liver, um, and it's also a good example of thrombosis in the liver. Thrombosis with focal, uh, focal necrosis, um, you should think of salmonella first because it's one of those diseases that produces abnormalities in the clotting function. Here's another good example of a thrombose, a thrombose uh, area in the liver. If, if, it's, if it's high up in the ra or lower end, at lower end of the vascular radical, then what you end up with is an infarct. And here the whole tip of the lobe is, uh, has undergone acute coagulative necrosis. Here's a, a normal spleen, and this is the spleen from that animal that we saw a while ago was enlarged. You can see by the leading edge, it's rounded. It should be more feather-like. There, there are areas like this where there's actually elevations in the capsular surface and with this yellow spot. If you look at that microscopically <laughs> under subgrowth, you, you, you'll see basically uh, not a lot, but you'll see these areas that are more eosinophilic, like this, and they turn out, in fact, to be uh, thrombi. And adjacent to these thrombi often are little microabscesses like that in the subcapsular region. And this is salmonella. Now, this is not salmonella. This is a uh, mouse, and it has a focally disseminated necrotizing hepatitis with punctate areas in the center of some of these lesions, and this is Tizer's disease. Tizer's disease now, doesn't always look the same in every species. Here it is in a gerbil. No punctate centers. And the lesions look like they're underneath the capsule a little deeper. They vary in size, but they're, they're still yellow. And here's a rabbit with tissues. And these le leaf lesions in some areas look almost red. And um, you, you'd have to consider uh, listeriosis in your differential diagnosis in the rabbit and depending on the circumstances, even to uremia. <coughs> but this is, again, the wart and starry stain with the pickup sticks. And this is Bacillus piliformis. And um, it's still a very common disease. Um, we recently had death in two rabbits from Tizer's disease in animals that had been on our turf for at least six months. The catch, though, was they were a knockout mouse for lipoxygenase gene. And lipoxygenase uh, is also, in, in addition to its role in atherosclerosis, is a macrophage inhibitor. So we think that that was the tie-in to the fact that they finally blew with this disease. The only, the first time we'd ever seen it since I've been there. This is Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and it's a good example of a liver disease that has this, these macrophages and lymphocytes around the outside and the focal areas of necrosis in the middle. Pseudo TB, here it is in the spleen. Necrotizing lesions in the center and more granulomas around the edge. This is mouse hepatitis virus in a nude mouse. And there, there's some individual cell necrosis in here around the edge of this more severe lesion, but the primary lesion is necrohemorrhagic hepatitis. And there is a little bit more hemorrhage, I believe, in the nude than in the conventional mouse. The hallmark for uh, mouse coronavirus infections are the presence of these syncytial giant cells. <coughs> Notice the uh, individual cell necrosis here. The size of some of these cells is enormous. But look how many nuclei are involved. There it was in the liver. Here it is in the intestine. And this is one of the reasons that some people use a, a, a roll technique where they roll the stomach and, and intestinal tract clear back to the anus, all on one section, and make one section through it. They use that technique to screen animals on a Q, just for QA purposes for the presence or absence of these syncytial giant cells. And you say, well, gee, I don't, that'd be hard to see a low power in your microscope. How about that one? That's got 25 nuclei. So it is a good way. Syncytial giant cells uh, are pretty unique to that disease. I know of one paper that describes syncytial giant cells with experimental ectromelia, but that was experimental. 
And if you want to get fancy and do electron microscopy, they, that corona is pretty diagnos diagnostic. And in some animals, they do, where you do spin, spin down the fecal pellets, the, this, is the, this is what you'll see in the fecal material. This is a good example of uh, hepatic toxidiosis in the rabbit. These lesions uh, coalesce and, and, and are quite extensive. Um, in this example, this is, a, is more of the early stages of, <coughs> of uh, the coccidiosis. I say that uh, for a reason. When they, as they progress and you get fibrosis that links up the portal triads, uh, the growth lesion changes to a linear shape. I'll show you in a minute. Here microscopically is the hallmark of this disease. So you get hyperplasia of the biliary epithelium and they form these papillary fronds like this and the protozoal stages, the coccidial stages, will be out in this area here. Uh, para paraportal inflammation is not uncommon with uh, Imeria stadii. This is a uh, scanning electron micrograph to show the various organisms. <coughs> and this is a, a later, a more advanced stage than I showed a while ago. And see how these lesions are more linear in shape? That's when they're starting to link up between, you can almost imagine that that's a portal triad and that's a portal triad and it's they, they've linked up in between. And this is the worst that can look. Uh, this is uh, macronodular cirrhosis in the rabbit liver due to hepatic coccidiosis. Microscopically, that last liver on the growth will, live like, will look like this microscopically. The bile ducts are uh, ectatic, the fronds are still there, but the, 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 the real change that's different is the periportal fibrosis in these livers. Not a lot of functional hepatocytes left. This is a close-up of, of a surface of a, of a liver from a rabbit that has a, a mycotic origin. These, and notice that these lesions uh, have kind of a rough, dry, almost crumbly appearance on touch surface. This is uh, pretty characteristic of uh, hyphae forming bacteria and the, and the types of lesions that occur. Um, I, this could have been a man, it could have been a dog, any animal that's uh, immunosuppressed and then uh, has a secondary or opportunistic infection. And uh, this is uh, a GMS of Candida albicans and one of the Zygomycetes group. <coughs> Cyst in the liver could be congenital cyst or acquired cyst, or it can be due to something like this, which is uh, Cystocircus fascialaris in the rat. Uh, I was sitting at my desk one time reading a slide off of a, uh, off of a six month interim sacrifice on a two year bioassay that was being done in a lab laboratory down south, and I ran across a, sl a slide that looked just like this one with a strobilocircus in it. And I said, uh oh. Got on a plane that night and went down there. I'd never been there before. And when I walked up to the animal facility, the cage washing machine, which is a tunnel washer, was halfway inside the building and halfway outside the building because they did that to conserve space. And the cages that had the bedding in them were sitting there next to the building on the clean side, and the, and the local cats were using it as a sandbox. <laughs> you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure that one out. Um, calcareous corpuscles are the hallmark diagnostic feature for tapeworms in tissues. If you see that, it's, that's, it has to be a tapeworm. Okay, here's a mouse with a big liver and a really big spleen. And uh, you start, you say, well, what, what, what kind of hemolytic anemia is that? That's, that's one of the possibilities. But hemolytic anemia doesn't cause mesenteric lymph nodes to get that big. And uh, that was a malignant lymphoma. Uh, that is one of many kinds of tumors that can occur in the liver or adjacent tissue. This is a good example of a rat with, with a solitary tumor that it is raised and, in this case, dark. That could be a hemangioma, hemangiosarcoma, or a hepatocellular tumor with hemorrhage. 
And many times in rodent hepatocellular tumors, there, there are cavernous spaces filled with blood, so don't let that fool you on the growth. This is a condition that uh, we described in the literature a few years ago uh, called hepatodiaphragmatic nodule. Uh, I, get, I get more telephone calls about this because uh, people that have never seen it before are really stymied by what it is. Uh, notice that this is the diaphragm right here. So you've got the liver on the, the other side of the diaphragm, and then through the diaphragm on the thoracic side, you have this nodule right here. And all that is is a protrusion of a liver lobe through a pre-existing rent and or a weak place in the diaphragm. And you get this little nodule of hepatocytes on the other side. And as, and as it grows, the hole gets smaller and it re causes restrictive uh, or ischemic change in this lesion. And you, you end up with this crazy looking hepatocyte slide that all has these little linear nuclei like that. You saw that in the heart, you saw it in the ischial myocyte. And it's, I've had uh, experimental pathologists tell me that that is probably a, a hallmark lesion for ischemia or anoxia. Hepatodiaphragmatic nodule. <coughs> now let's look at cutaneous diseases. Let's talk about those that can cause uh, appendage inflammation or amputation. You've got ringtail in the rat, hypothermia, sometimes intentional, sometimes not intentional. Uh, ectromelia, uh, streptobacillus meniliformis, and other forms of uh, biting or trauma, arthritis caused by these two agents. This is an uh, old slide of uh, ectromelia. It, and this, and this, there's, a, there's some swelling of this leg over here, but it's really, what you really notice over here is it's dark. This is gangrene. Early, early gangrene. So, but it's unilateral. Microscopically, uh, mousepox uh, is characterized by an ulcerative dermatitis, depending on which stage you catch it in. And um, if you catch it in the right stage, you can get these intracytoplasmic conclusion bodies, characteristic of poxic. And this, this was from experimental electromelia done by uh, uh, NIH. Dr. Tony Allen. And uh, this is a prefemoral lymph node, which ordinarily you can't even see. But when these animals get uh, infected with ectromelia, they really get enlarged. This is a massive necrotizing hepatitis. And no notice also that the gut associated lymphoid tissue is really exaggerated in, in this animal. Sometimes the liver lesions are not that severe. They're like this, more linear, closer to the edge. But look at the spleen in this animal. Severe necrotizing splenitis. And if you take the uh, gastrointestinal tract out and look at it, uh, here's the anus down here, and there's the fecal, there's the stomach. Notice that the primary lesions are in the duodenum and jejunum. Ilium appears to be at least partially uh, free of the lesion. And microscopically, uh, you'll see inclusion bodies and that the desquamated epithelium that's, out, epithelium that's out in the open will have a lot of inclusion bodies. And if you want to confirm it definitively, you could do electron microscopy and look for these dumbbell-shaped viral particles. Okay, back to the uh, cause of uh, the gangrenous foot or uh, one leg disease. Uh, ectromelia, it's not unusual at all to have two legs involved. And it's, uh, you may see the tail involved also. Here's a condition where there's a lesion up here high on the leg. It may have been a bite wound or it may be a associated. This, this foot's involved, but that one isn't. This foot's involved, but that one isn't. This foot's involved, but that one isn't. And none of them have tail lesions. This is Streptobacillus meniliformis. And this is the famous ringtail. You get a gangrenous tip on it and all these annular rings. And uh, you can uh, go in, you can, you can artificially produce it with less than 20% humidity. And uh, sometimes it takes two or three attempts. 
Now here's, a, here's a condition that uh, I had never seen before. These slides were given to me by Dr. Bill White. Um, evidently, the, 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 there was a hypothermia study, but the thermostat broke, and it got too cold. And uh, what happened was the animals had a frostbite leaf. Their tail, their, their ears fell off. And uh, this is what their tail looked like. So cold temperatures can do that. This is, these are causes of dermatitis in the mouth. Fungi and bacteria and exorbelia and bite wounds and tumors and parasitic infections. Never forget this one. It just never goes away. Here's um, a C57 black mouse that was one of several animals that from this one particular investigator's transgenic mice had these terrible, terrible looking uh, denuded areas with proliferative lesions on the surface. And uh, we necropsied some of these animals and all of them had fairly uh, extensive ulcerative dermatitis. But if you look out here where that blue is, this is an H&E stain, these are all bacterial colonies. And uh, I, it's very difficult to get a, a, a decent culture from a skin lesion and, and, and know whether it was the definitive organism or not. But uh, we, we got staph aureus out of this. No, I'm sorry, staph epiderm epidermidis. Um, uh, one thing that we see a lot from time to time are subcutaneous abscesses. Uh, if, if you've got a swelling underneath the neck, you have to say, well, is that a tumor of a salivary gland? Is it a sialocele? Is it, uh, you know, an inflammatory process? Is it a neoplasm? So you, uh, you know, you feel of it, make sure it's not hot. You, uh, if you want to, you can aspirate it. You can do, it. one thing that I do a lot of in our laboratory now are these, are cytoskin preps. I, I've, uh, I'm trying to train all of our clinicians to be good psychologists. And it's amazing what you can do in the live animal if you, if you use that technique on a, on a fairly regular basis. This was staff, but I have isolated pure culture um, pastorella pneumotropica out of these lesions as well. And this is a lesion that uh, is fairly common in the nude mouse because they don't have any eyelashes. They, uh, they, can't, they can't do, you know, keep all the dust out of their eyes. So, as in the bedding. So, they end up with these abscesses that are right next to the eye that involve the lacrimal gland. That's what all this pink material is. If you look at it um, on higher power, some of this is the secretory product from the lacrimal gland. This is a uh, somomus obesus, or fat sand rat. And uh, this is a case of botryal mitosis, which was staph. And uh, a little blood down here and where one of them ruptured but uh, it's multifocal in its distribution. This is a good example of pododermatitis in a guinea pig. This is the old disease called bumblefoot that was described uh, at the very first of the century. Uh, they, these most of the time can be avoided uh, by not letting the animal attain its maximum weight or by getting rid of the cages that are causing the lacerations on the foot to get infected. Um, what I do, if I, see a, if I see a cage that I have an animal or two that have this problem, I go into the, I go into the cage with a cotton ball in my hand and I, and I just rake it across the metal. If there's a barb on there, it'll pick that cotton ball, piece of it will fall off real quick. This is the bottom side of, the, of a guinea pig's mouth. And uh, this lesion here is proliferative, and it's one of those zoonotic diseases that guinea pigs and rabbits get. This is ringworm, and uh, that's trichophyton menecrophates. This is a this is a, a similar lesion in a rabbit, and uh, in this example though, um, there was an ex exothorax distribution of the ringworm, seen there with the periodic acid shift, and here with the Gomorrah's methenamine silver, and. Uh, it grows good on sabarod uh, media and on potato, potato meat media. And uh, you take those samples and look for macrocanidia like this and you put it all together and you've got microsporum canis in a rabbit. So um, you're not 
sure how that happened, but it probably it could have come from an animal caretaker even. Dog to man, back to the rabbit. Arth anthropoanotic disease. Here's a common condition seen in rabbits, and that's uh, the ear mite. And this is uh, Sarcopsis, or sor Sauropsis. And um, it's, it's a, a mite that can cause a lot of irritation and damage to the external ear canal and a lot of discomfort. Here's a, a rabbit that I necropsied in Vietnam in 1971. Um, didn't have a nice piece of glass to put it on, so I put it on this pal mat. Um, it had the same lesion I showed you in the last slide, which was a, uh, you know, a uh, acariasis in the ear, but also there is a cutaneous horn on the nose of this rabbit. Two morphologic diagnoses. The mites that cause these kinds of injuries in the guinea pig are Chiridus foides cavii and Trixaster cavii, and the rabbit, uh, Sauropsis caniculi, and Notedris cati and Chiatella, Chiatella parasitic orex. And um, here's a, a guinea pig that has lice. And uh, if you uh, look at it on a higher power, it kind of makes your skin crawl. Uh, this is Gyrobus ovalis. This is Glaricola porcelli. Both of these parasites can cause that kind of disease that you saw in the gross. What are the causes of alopecia in mice? Well, probably this is the most common one. The, the animal keeps sticking its nose through the cage long enough to actually rubs the skin uh, clean of hair. Uh, they, they sit there and lick each other and, and bite each other and can cause alopecia. Or you can have more serious problems like endocrine imbalances. A good example in dogs would be Cushing's disease. Uh, pregnancy, hereditary reasons, and Rio 3. And uh, see the line of demarcation right here? That's as far as his nose would go through. It's my imagination, or is his nose flat? Alopecia is fairly common in guinea pigs. Now, it's, it's fairly common in adult females, and they, it's, it's linked to estrogen problems. Why it occurs in young ones has never really been worked out well. Uh, zinc has been incriminated, uh, but now that we're, we're using all plastic cages and still see it, that pretty much eliminates that. Uh, all I know is that I took all the female breeders that produce offspring like this and euthanized them one time and kept back just the ones that didn't, and I never saw it again for two years. So I think it was probably a hereditary factor, but I don't know what. Um, if you see a case of alopecia, but it's all in one direction, like he's trying to get away from the person that had the teeth that did this, <laughs> this is, uh, these are bite wounds. If you, have, if you have three animals in the cage and two of them look like this and one of them doesn't, the one that doesn't is the one that did it to these. <laughs> and they, 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 they do establish their own pecking order. Guinea pigs, uh, without being really vicious, like to just chew on each other's ears. And this is ear chewing, where they form these little notches, and there's a little drop of blood out here on the tip. This is from an overzealous investigator that in injected barbiturates in the wrong place and produced a, a gangrenous ear with the barbiturate. That's an iatrogenic lesion. I throw this one in here just to make sure that you remember that, that hamsters do have marking glands, and in the male it's much more present than it is in the female. And um, they, you can get neoplasms that arise from that special uh, structure. What caused the kinky tail? Well, more than likely, that was iatrogenic with someone who came just a little bit too overzealous with, with tongs or thumb forces. When they pick the animal up, they squeeze too hard. And here's, here is that animal with the overlying skin. And here you can see the coccygeal vertebrae down here. 
And right here is where the fracture site was. And see all the bone sequestra up here? With a lot of infect, you know, a lot of inflammatory uh, response to it. Little pe pieces of the bone that were fractured away and are still in the tissue. Had to be painful. What do you think of when you think of tumors of the skin? Um, in the rat, if it's an epithelial tumor, you've got to think of basal cell origin. Uh, and if it's, when I say that, I mean it never differentiated past the basal cell when it formed the benign or the malignant disease. Or it did differentiate. Therefore, it's a sebaceous gland adenoma or carcinoma, or a hair shaft tumor, or in this case, a keratoacanthoma. Or it could have been squamous tumors. The squamous papillomas are not uncommon in rats, and here's one on the end of the nose. And here's a really good slide of keratoacanthoma. The, the keratoacanthoma has to have the opening. We call it that. And it produces keratin from underneath. And it, as the more, it, the more that it produces, it pushes it out in a compact form, and it forms this horn. And for some reason, they like the tail. And uh, here's one. If you, it's one of these deals, if you don't serial section it, you won't find the opening. But the opening should be right there. And here's, here's one where the opening was there. Okay? You look at these things under high power, they'll always have this basal cell layer right here from which everything else can, comes from. And here's the, here's the uh, keratin out here. Well, hamsters are pigmented animals, so pigmented animals can get melanoma. And lo and behold, hamsters do get melanoma. Rabbits get Schilt's fibroma. That's what this is. This is a cottontail rabbit. Proliferative disease. Here's a normal lacrimal gland. It has a porphyrin in it. It's a rat. Rats have red tears from time to time, and that's where it comes from. And next from this is arising a papillary tumor, um, and the, this is a, a lacrimal gland adenoma. Adenoma, it's benign. However, mice can get malignant ones that metastasize to the lung. So if you've got both of these in the same picture, you can tell the whole story. Lacrimal gland carcinoma with metastasis to the lung. And this is what they look like. It's embolic in its distribution. And because of the source, it has a lot of fat in it. And that's what these vacuolated cells are. Now you say, why is he showing that fishing line on that tail? Um, we do a lot of transgenic work at Baylor and the way that they the, the, the investigators determine phenotypic expression after the transgene is inserted is to do a southern blot. And the way they do that is they snip a piece of the tail off and they put this on here as a tourniquet. Well, in the process of doing that, they said, uh-oh, here's, here's something that shouldn't be there. And they uh, called in one of my veterinarians and we necropsied it. And here's the uh, overlying epithelium. There's the coccygeal vertebrae. Here's fat. There, this is striated muscle. This is all central nervous system tissue. There's respiratory epithelium, and there are dermal structures. Put that all together, and the animal's got a teratoma. Teratoma of the tail. <coughs> well, here's the other end of that animal. It's got a domed head. And it has nervous tissue, it has bone, it has dermal structures, or adnexa. It's got a teratoma of the brain and a teratoma of the tail. Now this is an example of a transgenic experiment that went awry. <laughs> <laughs> and
then an animal that has a tumor of the head and the tail must be a Republican. <laughs> rat diseases, the dermatologic lesions in rats include these causes, all these lice and mites, and why did I put pinworms in here? Well, <coughs> pinworms cause irritation in the terminal uh, anus, and they, they will scoot, and when they scoot, they cause irritating lesions around the anal uh, rectal junction. These are modified sebaceous glands, the preputial gland, the clitoral gland, and the zimbal gland of the ear, and then swollen faces, as I showed er earlier, can uh, be misinterpreted as a dermatologic condition, <laughs> if, and when in fact it may be an underlying salivary gland disease. This is a normal preputial gland from a Fisher 344 rat. They're bilobe, there's, there's one on each side of the midline, they're smooth surface. They're this large, which surprised a lot of people. And on the subgrowth, you know, they're intact. They, 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 uh, they're pretty solid, and they have a capsule around them. And this is an animal that was on a carcinogenicity study with a benzidine dye. And this preputial gland tumor is quite enlarged. And microscopically, it uh, has lymphatic invasion and invasion of the tumor into the adjacent uh, tissues. This was an adenocarcinoma <coughs> arising from preputial gland. Uh, this is the ear of a rat with the pinna removed, and you can see right here there are two structures, and those are the zimbal glands. This is a, a microscopic section through that area. You can, still, you can see the cartilage in the pinna in the ear canal, and here's the presence of this gland, which uh, pretty much looks like a sebaceous gland if it was any other location, and pretty well organized. And arranged in lobules. It has a basal cell component to it. And here's a, an earlier stage of a zimbal gland tumor. And with, the, with these benzidine dyes, like 3', three prime dimethoxybenzidine, um, they, we got a progression from hyperplasia to adenoma to carcinoma. And the same study, in the same study, we had mammary gland tumors, and we had tumors arising from the skin from several different adnexa, and we had these and the preputial gland tumors. So it appeared that the target organ was really basal cells. Large mass on the side of the face, you'd have to think of, of um, submaxillary, I mean, I mean uh, salivary gland origin, um, neoplasia or inflammatory process, um, or since some of these are at the base of the ear, a zimbal gland tumor. And this is, in fact, a zimbal gland adenocarcinoma. It's, it's more disorganized. It uh, has an, a very high mitotic index. And uh, it was extremely invasive. Here's a, a rat with a large mass here, and you say, well, where is that coming from? Is that coming from a bone in the leg, or is it coming from the skin, or is it coming from the mammary gland? Where is it? If you, if you look at it a little closer, you're still not sure whether it's coming from the underlying bone, but if you turn around the other way, the thing that was amazing to me was this big mass had one blood vessel going to it. And we see ischemic necrosis from time to time in these things. This is probably the reason. But these are slow-growing tumors. They're the fibroadenoma of the breast, or the mammary gland in the rat. And um, they just don't outgrow their blood supply normally. And they shouldn't get this big. We shouldn't allow them to get that big. Uh, this one obviously was, but um, you're, if, you had, if you have control over the study, you shouldn't allow them to get this big. And this is a cut surface, and there's, there's uh, areas in here that look like fibrous connective tissue. The rest of it looks pretty glandular, but I can tell you that it was very difficult to cut with an, when we dissected it. And in this case, there was more fibrous connective tissue here, more collagen, and less gland but fibroadenoma is still the, the, uh, 
di diagnosis of sorts. Here's a mouse with a mass. And again, you don't know whether that's a hernia or whether it's a mass underneath or, uh, or whether, uh, you know, it's, it, you don't know where it's, where it's coming from for sure. If you uh, looked at it after it's the skin is exposed, you still don't have a lot of information. But one thing that you can always count on, masses from a mouse can be of mammary gland origin until proven differently. About the only place I've never seen a mammary tumor on a mouse is right between the shoulder blades on the dorsal. But I've seen mammary tumors just about every other part of the body, including the neck. That's what this is. And Thelma Dunn wrote a beautiful essay years ago and described all of these mammary tumors and the viral, the viral etiology of some of them. And, and uh, that, those descriptive terms and the way she described those neoplasms then is still as applicable today as it was then. You may not agree with some of the terms because we get a little fancier as we go to WHO meetings. But the nomenclature uh, is still pretty good, and this, is a, and this would be a, a, a type B Dunn's, class, Dunn's classification mammary tumor, mammary adenocea. And this one's hot. It's invading the normal, the, the muscles in around it. Let's talk about nude mice venigrafts for a second. Um, if any of you have worked with them or not, I don't know if you have worked with them or not, but um, to take a human tumor and put it in a nude mouse and try to get the human tumor to grow requires a, a little bit of witchcraft sometimes. But it is a, it's a valuable source of uh, bulking up is, this, is the term and you hear people use. Because what, what will happen is you'll get a small sample in from the surgeon and it's not enough to do everything that you want to do with. You want to do immunohistochemistry, you want to do electron microscopy, you want to start a cell culture line, and there isn't enough to go around. So you do, you do what you can, and then you take a piece of the tumor, and you do two things, you do three things to it. You take part of the original tumor, and you mince it up into one millimeter cubes, and you put it subcutaneously into a nude mouse. You take one piece, and you use collagenase, and you digest out the fibrous connective tissue, and then disassociate the cell, spin down, pour off the supernatant, reconstitute it, and put it in the mouse. Or you take that sample and you try to grow it in tissue culture with and without enzymes. And if it grows in tissue culture, then you put the tissue culture in the nude mouse. And if you can get the tumor that would not grow in the tissue culture but did grow in the nude mouse to grow in the nude mouse, then you put it back in tissue culture. And lo and behold, after it's been in the nude mouse for a while, sometimes it will grow in tissue culture. So you take all these things together and you end up with more, more material to do the following. Define the tissue of origin, help define the biological activity of the neoplasm, and to do research, I mean, you, you, you've invented a research resource. If you take all of the types of tumors that come in from the surgeon, this is what the success rate would be if you put them into nude mice. Melanomas grow real well. So do colonic carcinomas. And then it decreases from uh, counterclockwise, okay? And the one that grows the poorest is the breast tumor. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, if, you d if you supplement the mouse with estrogen in the form of tablets or slow release to an Alzap mini pump that's, that's either put in the abdominal cavity or subcutaneously, uh, you can get those tumors to grow a lot better. You, you've increased your chances of growing breast cancer by at least 30 or 40 percent with the estrogen supplementation. Well, here's what a new venograph looks like for those of you who haven't done it. And uh, there's a little dark spot right there. So if, if, we were, if we were watching this animal, we'd watch it real close to make sure that that, that doesn't end up with being an ulcer. Because secondary infections uh, don't, they, they tend to ruin your data. And it's not good for the animal. Uh, I believe that was a parotid gland adeno CA. 
from the front ari arising from the salivary gland, and it, that's what that's what a salivary gland tumor looks like. And it's there, this is the overlying skin, and this is the muscle underneath it. And this is a very well differentiated tumor. It's even secretory. This is one of only four or five tumors I saw out of a thousand that metastasized the lung. Here was a metastasis. If we roll the, roll the lung over, it's more obvious on the other side. <coughs> and it looks like a metastatic tumor in the lung. Very embolic. And uh, that's, that's uh, very rare, though, that they metastasize, like, metastasize that widely in the lung. Um, when you're doing this kind of work, you have to read your samples quick. So one of the ways we do it to determine whether that's negative is to do a massage. And if it's fibrous connective tissue and there's no other cells around, it's a negative. One way to do it without some special stain is just to polarize it. And uh, if that zone, which is supposed to be the tumor, polarizes, then it, it was a negative. Uh, malignant melanomas grow quite well. And they even produce sigma. And they have tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And you can harvest these cells and study them, which has been done right across the street at the National Cancer Institute. What about lymphoid diseases? I have one case that tells it all. It is a nude mouse with a naturally occurring follicular lymph lymphosarcoma. And, uh, the best way to learn your no lymph node an anatomy is for him to get a tumor like this. Look at these, look, look at these mandibular and, and superficial cervical lymph nodes. And here's one that's behind the scapula, you know? So it's not uh, pre-scapular. It's probably axillary in that region. There's the prefemoral. These are the deep and superficial cer uh, cervical lymph nodes, and probably the mandibular is in there. And uh, there is a prefemoral node. I'm sorry, prescapular node. And here in the neck is our, and this is the deeper lev level. This is after we remove those ones we just saw, and those are deep cervical. These are behind the, the, le the front leg, so they're axillary. And then you took all of that off, and you ended up with the lungs that are underneath. And then these are anterior mesenteric. Well, again, you don't always see those. And then the liver was enlarged, and the spleen was enlarged. All the bronchoassociated lymphoid tissue was enlarged in the lung, and the gall in the intestinal tract was enlarged. And we took out the intestines. And we, clip, we stayed right close to the intestinal tract when we did the dissecting. So we got all these mesenteric and pancreatic lymph nodes. Then we remove those. And here's the uterus. And there's the urinary bladder. And this is the iliac lymph node. And those are the kidneys. And these are the renal lymph nodes. And then we took out that one. And there's another one. And there's a deep iliac lymph node, and that's what that one is. And this is to prove that it was a follicular lymphoma. Don't see a lot of those. That's real unusual in my experience. And it was in the lymph nodes as well. That was the spleen. So uh, generalized lymphosarcoma was, or malignant lymphoma was the diagnosis in that case. Uh, people say, well, how common are those in nude mice? Those are not uncommon at all in nude mice. But a lot of those tumors come from the bone marrow. People forget that they, just because they don't have a thymus, they can still get a lymphoma. Neuromuscular diseases. Normal mouse, and this is a litter mate. A little bit more of a, a runted animal. A uh, little bit of a bulge on the top of that guy's head. And in hydrocephalus. When we took this calvarium off, it collapsed. Not your smartest mouse. 
<laughs> and this is exencephaly and a guinea pig. And here's, here it looks from the side view with it sticking out over here. Not very common. Common tumor in the rat is the, is the pituitary tumors. And uh, chromophobe adenomas, usually. Very common cause of death, however, because they rupture and they hemorrhage and then the pressure kills them. One of those classic examples of a benign tumor that kills you. Here's another one. The brain's been reflected forward like that. And here's another one, very large. And microscopically, they have these, these cystic cavernous spaces filled with blood. So it would only take one of these near the surface to rupture and then, then you'd be in trouble. You can't talk about the brain without talking about toxoplasmosis and encephalozoonosis. Uh, every, about every year they find another, another animal that has this one in it. Um, this is PAS posi, this isn't. H and E, you, can, you can't see this very well, but you can see this one pretty good. This one's acid fast negative, this one's acid fast positive. And this one's this one stains positive with a gram stain, and this one doesn't. Easy. If it's sitting there in tissue and it has not ruptured, notice that there is no host response. In a rat or a mouse, if this one ruptures, I mean this one ruptures, you get a glial reaction. If you send a rabbit and it ruptures, you get a granulomatous reaction. And it's just that simple. I mean, they did they they. You very seldom ever see granulomatous lesions in a rat or a mouse brain. This is a rat brain. And you just barely can tell if that's, a, that's an encephalozoan cyst. It doesn't have a nice wall to it like Toxo does. Animals spin and circle, and they usually do it to the left or the right, and that's where the lesion is. And um, here's an animal that's got his head tilt to the left, and there's, there's another animal that's got his head tilted to the left. And uh, you, you can culture these animals' ears, and that's worth quite a bit. But otitis media and otitis interna are the usual cause of that, but it could be a brain lesion. It could be a foreign body in the ear, and you just matter of getting down there and taking it out, and the problem goes away. We don't know anything. We had a group of animals from one vendor, all about two mice, that came in with, and they circled to the left or the right, and we cultured them, and we didn't get anything. And I finally got upset and decided to do coronal sections to the head, serial sections, and I did. And this is the contralateral ear, and it was normal. And there's the tympanic membrane. And on this one, I found this. And a six-week-old cloud sea mouse. Wonder what that is. Went down and looked at that, and I saw concretions or calcareous formations here. Little rocks in his ear. Rocks. The last time I looked it up in a book, we're not chemotactic for neutrophils. There's a rock. It's chemotactic. There's probably a bacterium in that rock someplace <laughs> that is chemotactic. But I, every one of them that we did this technique on, we found this one. So you can say otolith. You know? But... That's probably as descriptive as anything. What about this, this guy? Everybody says, oh, that's something that you read about in books. Uh, not if you're doing time pregnancy studies in rats. The problem with this disease is we order the rats too old to see it. All of us that do rat research. But if you're doing time, if you're doing time pregnancy work, you'll see this occasionally. And uh, so far, I found it in two vendor sources. And you know, classically, there's this picture right here that everybody has in their slide collection. There's hemorrhages in the brain, hemorrhages in the spinal cord. It's a, 
parvovirus. But this is two years ago at my own facility. I had a little five or six week old rat puppy come in and, the, and the, the receiving clerk said, Doc, you better come over and look at this rat. It's sleeping on its feet. And that, it was just sitting there and kind of in a stupor. And we euthanized it and had hemorrhages in the cerebellum. And you know, you have to think of trauma in a case like this. There, were fo there was a focal area of hemorrhage lots of hemorrhage in the cerebellum. And a little area right there that looked a little malacic. You see, there were three separate areas of the cerebellum that were affected with this hemorrhage. And uh, if you go down to one of these zone interface areas, there's necrotic debris here. That didn't happen from a traumatic injury. That's been going on just a little bit longer and the malacia and the necrotic debris together tell me that there's probably something going on here. And we went back and checked the room that these animals came from, from the vendor source, and lo and behold, it was. Parvovirus is also getting mice, and it's called minute virus of mice. And I don't have a slide to, to, of a mouse, so I put a slide from a cat in here to show cerebellar hypophagia. <laughs> M minute virus of mice does cause this, naturally as well as experimentally. Naturally as well as experimentally. So if you see that disease in a mouse, beware, because quite a few vendors have MVM. I hate to say this, but I have this disease, and I can't get rid of it after four years, even using microisolator cages. And, uh, it's part of the problem is that the animals are worth three thousand dollars a piece. So if we we're 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 getting ready to go through a complete not a cesarean re-derivation, but a we're freezing eggs on all these animals, and then we're going to do um, cryo you know use cryopreserved eggs and do embryo transfers. And that's I figure that should solve it. But I've tried my darndest getting rid of it. We're using more simpler techniques, and I haven't been able to. This is not a Tyler CD7 mouse. This is a mouse with muscular dystrophy, but it demonstrates posterior paresis real well. And if you look at the spinal cord from these animals, you start seeing little areas of too many cells, especially around blood vessels. And yet, lo and behold, there's a lymphocytic cardiovascular cuff and focal gliosis and neurons that are dying. And more neurons that are dying in the hippocampus, and more neurons that are dying, and uh, nice fresh tissue, and focal gliosis, and meningitis. So we've got a non-separative meningoencephalitis, and uh, with individual cell death and neuronal, neuronal necrosis, and uh, it's FA positive for GD7. We've shown that. So. That is not a disease of the past, like some people would tell you. And uh, I would seriously uh, suggest that you, when you're checking animals serologically, that, that is one virus you should check for. Well, what else can cause paralysis and paresis in mice? Muscular dystrophy, other forms of myositis, nutritional myopathies like vitamin E, congenital defects, vascular occlusion, various forms of trauma, especially in the rabbit when they're picked up the wrong way, and then you get fractured backs, and neoplasia. I spent the uh, biggest part of three years working on the pathology of the P53 knockout mouse, which uh, is an animal model for leaf Ramini syndrome in man, but it's basically a tumor suppressor gene. If you take the tumor suppressor gene out, they get cancer. All the animals, are, all the homozygotes are dead by the ninth month. 100% of them die of cancer. Uh, this, was one, this was not one of those animals, but it could have been. There was a, a, ri a, a, a raised area right there, seen here. When in doubt, use a dental radiograph, and you get nice pretty pictures of mice with scoliosis and lower doses, or the other way around. 
and you dissect it out and you get something that looks like this and it could be an abscess or it could be a neoplasm. And it turned out this is a sagittal section through the vertebral column. And here's the spinal cord. And there's the spinal canal with something in it. And here's the, here's the lateral process of the vertebrae. And there's basophilia in the bone marrow that looks kind of like the same stuff that's out in the muscle. And here it is in the bone marrow. It's a lymphoblastic lymphoma. And here it is where it came out of the bone marrow and invaded the lumbar musculature. Here it is here. Real high mitotic index. And we see a lot of those. And here's the reason he was paralyzed. Here, here is the ganglia. Down here at the back, you know, near the, the uh, cauda equina. And right here's, the, here's the, the ganglia. See the tumor cells right up in it? If you had a tumor growing that close to a nerve, you'd be hurting too. And as you would expect, those muscles downstream from that have neurogenic atrophy. Well, the reason I tell you this <coughs> is that that's the only manifestation of lymphoma that this animal had. There was no involvement of the liver, the spleen, or the nose. So if you get an animal that's paralyzed, do a sagittal section down the back and look for lymphoma as the cause of the paralysis. And these, th this is, uh, is uh, another one of these cases from the P53 experiment. And when you get them like that, right here is the list of tumors that it could be. All these, all these sarcomas and mammary carcinoma metastatic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming out. Mm -hmm.